going to move on to our panel. We have three players coming from Iberia. These are the leaders from Iberia in terms of data science for social good. And I wanted to introduce each one uh, to, for them to speak about their organizations. First of all, I wanted to introduce Ana Laguna. Ana Laguna is the co-founder of So Good Data, and she's also an entrepreneur who created Sound Dream, whose goal is to create a model to translate baby cries, needs, and emotions. So we see a person that not only is inspired about social good, but she even started her own journey in entrepreneurship, um, specifically to help mothers and fathers to interpret what their babies are trying to communicate to them. That being said, I'm going to welcome Ana Laguna to the stage and give you the word for you to talk about what you're doing in your company. Hello. Hi, Anna. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much, Anna, for the presentation and Thank you, everybody, for the organization of the event. It's great to be to be part of it and to be here today. Um, let me share my uh, screen. Do you see my screen? Yes, we can. Everybody see my screen, right? It's okay. Yes, we can. You can proceed. Okay. So, well, as Anna um, already introduced me, I'm Anna Laguna, um, and co-founder uh, at Sound. As she already explained, it's a startup where we try to analyze baby cries uh, from from the needs and emotion point of view, but also from a social point of view, uh, because now we are trying to also. Um, uh, are working on on pathologies, uh, analyzing cries for the for the early diagnosis of some pathologies like uh, autism, hyperthyroidism, uh, asphyxia, etc. So also very related with the social impact. Um, well, and apart from the my my experience on the on, on the startup world, uh, as Anna already said, I I found it uh, around two years ago. So good date. Um, and so good data um, is is a is a is an Spanish NGO, right? Uh, with the goal of really applying data science techniques uh, to social problems. That's the that's the goal of the of the organization. And well, the the NGO uh, really emerged, emerged from from a need, a real need, because uh, for almost a decade. I was working uh, for big companies, big corporations, writing my, my data analysis techniques, my expertise, um, always trying to improve a single KPI. The KPI was money, wanted to save money, wanted to have more money. And after some years working on trying to sell more mortgages, trying to sell more, 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 more shoes, more loans, whatever, I was like, I was thinking it's, it's, a, it's a pity to invest my expertise uh, in order to help humanity, right? Um, so that's really the, the how, how so good data uh, emerged some time ago. So our goal is basically um, to bring together uh, all the unexplored data that we can imagine from public organizations or even for, for, for a private organizations but a uh, organization that really lack of resources, human resources uh, with expertise on data analysis, and putting together all the explode uh, data and, um, and and the expertise of data analysts uh, from the different uh, and heterogeneous um, uh, domains in order to really achieve some, some social challenges around the world. So you can say, okay, and how is it possible? Well, uh, it's possible because we have humans with us uh, is our most important tool. So we have a pool of volunteers, uh, as I said before, from so many domains, and uh, they are passionate uh, uh, volunteers uh, that really want to want to uh, have like, uh, they really want to generate impact using uh, their, their expertise on, on, on data analysis, and also looking for a, for a really a, a social problem um, to be solved. And how do we tackle um, we? Okay, these problems. Where uh, the first thing that we do is let's think about the problem that we could solve, and for that we particularly based on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. 
And once we, we have a problem in mind, uh, we start looking for data, right, for public or private data, as I said before. So once we have the data and a problem that we want to solve, we start working on that in order to generate uh, impact, right? So we can think about uh, our our strategy like like a split off in in two sections. So on on one hand, we have all the artificial intelligence and data science project we work on in order to to gain insights and analysis of the the, the triggers that we could act or, or or the things that we could do to improve a, a, a determined problem. And on the other hand, we are also working on social awareness because, as you know, now today biases, um, ethics, and all all these topics around artificial intelligence is like very important. So it's also our 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 goal, as we will see later. So now let's start talking about the projects, a uh, data science project that we have been working uh, during the last um, three years, uh, two years, sorry. So for example, uh, one of them related with food and health. In this case, we collaborate with Nielsen, um, and uh, in our collaboration, they provide us a, a big database with uh, data, uh, including food consumption, uh, in Spain, in the main stores in Spain, supermarkets and groceries, uh, that represent, represent around 98% of the, of the food population. So what we are trying to do with this is trying to, to analyze the impact of the food consumption on, on the health of the people, right? And specific on some chronic disease like um, cholesterol, diabetes, or etc. So we are trying to see um, how people uh, eat depending on the regions, on the different regions in Spain, and how this um, how this uh, kind of um, food um, could be related with some uh, um, disease, right? So of course, um, correlation do not imply causation, but we start getting some interesting insights. Right? Like, for example, people with obesity uh, normally eat more uh, cream, ice creams, uh, sugar drinks, uh, things like this, uh, chorizo, things like this, no? So we start having, like, uh, interesting analysis, but we still keep on working on, on their project. This is one project, as I always say. Uh, we have several ones, for example, this one related with violence, is with uh, social harassment. Uh, in this case, we collaborate with Holpac. It's a movement um, at the U.S., uh, at the United States, and they focus on end with the harassment, especially in, in public um, spaces, right? So they have a website when, when you can uh, report an, harass an harassment um, all around the world. So in this case, what we are trying to do is to uh, automatically, with machine learning algorithms, um, classify uh, the reviews in order to understand the reaction of the bystander. If the bystander uh, has a, a real impact on the victim or on the on, or the aggressor, um, and automatically classify all, all these things in order to see if we can do something on in order to to aware the population, right? Uh, another project in this case related with uh, education. Well, based on Nelson Mandela quote, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Uh, we are working with a database in um, the area of Buenos Aires on, on, on Argentina. Um, and what we try to do is to analyze the triggers, like the more important features that uh, have an impact on the failure of success um, of the education of students at the school on this uh, metropolitan area of, of Buenos Aires. Um, and even if this study is finished, we already start getting some nice insights, like, for example, that the internet connection uh, at the school could be something important. It could be like very easy solve this problem no then we have we see other statistics more complicated maybe and we should need the governments to solve it like for example differences on the success uh, depending on the rural or urban environment of the students depending on the if the if students are going to public or private schools or even the um, the studies or the or the socioeconomical um, status of the um, of the families this is our, this, those three are the main two projects we have been working in during this time. But we also have some other projects uh, that maybe are in a in a more uh, early phase, but they are starting 
part. So, for example, in this case, we work um, on with pollution because for us it's very important, and specifically pollution in Madrid, right? So we have data from the pollution in Madrid, and we try to see the impact of these uh, like very polluted days on the health of respiratory um, uh, disease, right? So we have on the other side um, um, data from the from the hospitals, admissions at the hospital, in specifically in departments with respiratory disease, and we try to see uh, how these admissions could be affected by the, in, the the increment of the NO2 concentration. So it's still working on, but we already see some correlations of the time series. Um, so it looks like interesting to continue the analyze. Um, other other subjects uh, in this case equality. Um, this is based on a on on a study already carried out some a couple of years ago on Nordic countries by Kleben et al. Um, and where in this case they they were trying to analyze the penalties on female and male earnings uh, after the arrival of a third child. Right. So, for example, in their studies, they already realized that in case of females, the earnings uh, decline a, a lot. Right. So we're trying to do the same replica um, for, for the data that we have in Spain. Uh, and we already know a univer an university in Spain already also working on, on, the, on the project. Um, well, of course, um, today COVID is everywhere and we also wanted to contribute to this problem. So as I said before, I, I've been working for several years now, I can say, in, in sound processing. Uh, on cries, and I thought, why not try to you to 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 apply it, uh, this same technique to see if we can also use CAT um, in order to help on COVID early diagnosis. So together with some colleagues, we launched this website during spring. Um, uh, so you can you can record your your voice and uh, provide us with instead of cries is, uh, with some path. Uh, we are still collecting data, but it's true that we don't have any data yet to start like robust analysis. I really invite you to, uh, unfortunately, share share the website. Um, and the last point is, uh, as I said before, that we are on artificial intelligence social awareness. So what we do is uh, to schools, universities, and conference in order to inspire students with with science, technology, engineering, and maths. Uh, also explaining the, the potential of, arti of artificial intelligence um, and, and to talk about the artificial intelligence social awareness that I said before, like ethics, uh, biases, and so on. So, well, um, that's my last word for finishing. I really, I really invite you to join the very young Alien. I know the writer, Eduardo Galeano, says, little people in little places doing little things can really change the world. So a pleasure to be here and um, you are interested really to join us. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I think you and your presentation in a great with a great phrase, which really represents everything that uh, we all also believe around this movement. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well thank you very much. I imagine I need to leave. I don't know Anna. Yes, so now we are going to welcome to the stage Carlos. And uh, I'm just going to briefly introduce him. So Carlos Daniel Santos is an assistant professor at Nova School of Business and Economics. And is also an academic director, co-director of Nova Data Science Knowledge Center. He studied his PhD in London School of Economics and has collaborated with universities around the world, uh, including University of Alicante and MIT. Now I'm going to give you the word, Carlos, for you to talk about your work so far in the organization and how is that impacting the population. Hello, Carlos. Welcome. Hello, Anna. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you, everybody, for, for watching me uh, here. Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to basically try to introduce also uh, the projects we're trying to develop here at Nova SPE, and in particular, the center that I'm co-directing with, uh, with Light, the uh, Data Science uh, Knowledge Center. Let me just share my uh, slides.
Okay, so everybody's seeing, I hope. So um, we have a mission here in the center that we've tried to find early on, and our objective here is advancing the knowledge about data-driven decision-making and its impact on society. So I'd like to emphasize two parts here, the data-driven decision-making part and also the impact on society. Okay, so the idea is that we are a business school, we are an economic school, and we try to train the managers of uh, managers of the future, and hopefully these managers will, will take actions that will have a positive in impact on our, our society. So uh, my agenda for today is basically I'll start with the, the activities uh, that we uh, conduct here at NOVA, and then I'll pass to the projects uh, that we've been developing, and also to the education side. And then finally, our, our team. So um, in terms of, so we are in a, a research university. Our core uh, area is education and research. So these are our, our, our two main actors in, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this value chain. Uh, our education part is mostly uh, our students that we are trying to uh, uh, promote and develop their skills uh, and also trying to uh, make the transition to the business world here, having experience with other organizations, companies, state organizations, NGOs, etc. So in this area, we try to have uh, research projects, uh, master thesis, etc., applied projects that will uh, allow students not only to get a theoretical uh, education, but also a very practical uh, education. And then finally, of course, our second pillar is research. So we as faculty have to do research, conduct research, produce articles, papers, case studies, et cetera. And in that aspect, students are very important, but also our collaboration with companies, NGOs, and public actors. So the next thing I want to talk about is our project that we have been developing here at the Data Science uh, Knowledge Center. Um, so here I have a sneak peek of seven projects I should emphasize that most of these projects have been developed uh, during the Data Science for Social Good uh, summer fellowships uh, that we've been uh, having here at uh, Nova SD. Okay, so the first project I want to talk about is a project together with the public authorities in Croatia, where the objective is trying to detect children at risk of not being vaccinated. You know, we know that there's a current trend and movement into in the anti-vaccination. Uh, people that want to don't want to vaccinate their kids, and the idea here is to try to use data that was supplied by the public authorities to identify who are children that are at risk of not getting vaccinated, so that the authorities can deploy the mechanisms and the staff in the context trying to uh, uh, convince these people to get or the parents to, to uh, vaccinate their children. The second project I want to talk about is also related with medical uh, uh, issues. It's uh, trying to predict who are the people that are more likely to develop diabetes, and in particular, diabetic nephro uh, nephropathy. Okay, so we are uh, working together with uh, some public uh, uh, health authorities. In particular, this project uh, uh, was uh, uh, won the uh, Data for Change yearly competition that we have here at NOVA uh, that is trying to support NGOs. So this project is a very important project. So if you are running an NGO, please let us know. Uh, apply for this project. Uh, this is sponsored by BPE and uh, La Caixa Foundation. And so they, in they invest money and they invest resources trying to help NGOs. So in this case, uh, uh, the objective is trying to uh, predict uh, the probability that someone is going to develop diabetes. And of course, if we know this, we can take measures that will uh, help uh, 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 reduce the number of diabetic people in the population. The third project I have here is a project that we have developed together with the Portuguese uh, uh, Employment Agency. Um, and uh, one of the problems that the employment agency faces is long-term unemployment. So people that are employed for a long period of time, it's very hard to get them to come back to the workforce. And so we've uh, collected data together with them, or we collected data from them, and we developed a, a, a project that actually was sponsored by the uh, Science and Technology Foundation here in Portugal. And the objective here is trying to predict who are the people that are more likely to become long-term uh, unemployed, and so that the uh, uh, health, the, um, the employment authorities and employment agency can also deploy their resources to prevent this from happening. Okay. 
The fourth project I want to talk about is a project that we developed with a private healthcare provider here in Portugal, the José Mel Saúde. And the idea here is it's kind of a recommendation system, really. So we are trying to match patients with the doctors. So we have doctors on one side, we have patients on the other side. Normally, patients get roles recommended to the same doctors, and we are trying to get a way or a system that allows us to match the patients to the ideal doctors for themselves. So based on their history and their historical uh, results, we can try and find a doctor that fits their needs better. Okay. The idea here is that we can improve the uh, uh, outcome of healthcare, in this case, for a private healthcare provider. The fifth project I want to talk about is a project that we've developed uh, a couple of years ago and it's, it has been ongoing uh, together with the governments of Portugal and the governments in Tuscany, Italy. Uh, uh, this, in this project, what we do, we use uh, uh, cell phone data trying to predict the movement of tourists around the city so that we can uh, create plans for a more sustainable tourism. One of the problems that these governments face, in particular Lisbon, for example, has this problem that there's a lot of tourism, there's a, an overcrowding of tourists in some areas. So how can we use the information from the uh, uh, cell, phone com cell, uh, cell phone communications uh, to uh, uh, reduce uh, 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 the, the number of tourists? or the impact of the excessive tourism. The sixth uh, project I want to talk about is uh, uh, one that we developed together with a PPL, one of the largest Portuguese crowdfunding platform, uh, trying to support uh, 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 social in initiatives of crowdfunding. So in this case, uh, we're trying to understand what kind of, uh, 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 what kind of uh, initiatives are more likely to be successful are more likely to raise the full amount of money and are more likely to be implemented in the future. Okay. And the last one is a project that was developed together with the government of the Netherlands, uh, is actually, with the traffic authorities in particular, is trying to predict uh, the number of car crashes uh, uh, in the Netherlands. Okay. So we have data from road accidents. We also have data from traffic. And it's very important that you deploy uh, 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 the, the, the staff and the personnel uh, fast when there's a road accident. And so the objective here was trying to predict where road accidents were more likely to occur and also where we should locate the staff along the, the, the highways. Okay, so that's it for our project. So let, let me know or let us know. Uh, I'll give you the, 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 the people in the, in, the, in the data center um, um, that you can contact. But let us know if you want to work on one of these projects. Do you have ideas that can be developed later on? The second thing I want to talk about is we do projects, but the, the core of our business, let's say, is education. So here we've had uh, basically three uh, main opportunities. The first is a project or a, a, a training that we, we have on for, for managers, which is the data science for managers. This is a very intensive five-day program that any manager can enroll. We're going to have the next one in uh, November and December. So also, if you are interested, uh, please go ahead and ask us something or uh, enroll. The second is a project that we developed with Le Wagon. It's a data science bootcamp. So this is a long-term project to teach people and uh, 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 students how to do data science. And the last one I want to talk about is a new master's program we just launched this year. It's the master's in business analytics. So we are very excited with this project, we need, with this master's, because this is going to be a completely new master's in our in our offering, and it's going to uh, train uh, uh, managers in business analytics. Finally, I want to just talk uh, about our team. So there's me and Laid, who are the directors, the academic directors. Then we have Patricia Schufer, uh, my colleague, who's the uh, uh, chief education officer, more involved in the education part. And finally, our chief technology officer, our colleague, Chiwei Han. And then finally, of course, the executive director, Lenny Mestrino. So if you can find us, please let us know if you want to be involved in any of our projects or if you have ideas that we can develop together, okay? Finally, the data scientists that do all the hard work, really, uh, we have Susana, Miguel, Ricardo, Eddie, João, Bruna, Eduardo, Paulo, Alice, and Pedro. These are the people that are actually working every day uh, uh, in this in this center, so I thank you all of them uh, 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 very much. 
Okay, so let us know if you have any ideas and thank you for listening. Thank you, Carlos. And also for us, I think it's a pleasure to see how many diverse projects you run so far in the Knowledge Center, ranging from unemployment, healthcare, um, traffic. So it, I, I think it gives uh, everyone a good perspective of how, um, uh, how many use cases you can do with the same with the with the with the with this concept of data science, machine learning, and related concepts. Data so driven decision making. That's our goal. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Anna. Thank you all. Thank you again. So now I'm going to introduce the next uh, and last speaker of this panel. It is Miguel. Uh, Miguel is one of the co-founders of Data Science for Social Good Portugal and works as well as a data science lead in Mojo Diagnostics using AI for fertility care. Without further ado, I'm going to welcome him to the stage where he's going to talk about all about our project. Okay. Uh, is everything okay with the sound? Do I need to... It's okay. Cool. Do the sound. Everything is So let me just do the dance of sharing the screen. Wait. Okay. Tell me when you have it, and mm -hmm. if you can help me there. Okay. Yeah. Loading and all set. Okay. Cool. Go ahead. And it's moving. Um, okay, uh, so hello everyone. Uh, I hope you're enjoying this summit uh, as much as I am. Uh, my name is Miguel and uh, I'm co-founder of uh, DSSG Portugal, Data Science for Social Good Portugal. And I'm also part of the, the, the lead team. Um, I would like to start this presentation by stating uh, what I will not talk about. And uh, I will not talk about the potential of data for good in an abstract way. And I will not give you a motivational speech on how you can save the world with data science, okay? Uh, today, what I want to do is instead talk to you about starting a data for good initiative and more specifically about DSSG Portugal, how we work, what we have achieved, but most importantly, what we learned about starting this movement from scratch, an adventure that started back in uh, 2018. So I compiled major uh, six major lessons learned and I want to share them with you all, okay? So we'll just go uh, lesson by lesson. Uh, our lesson one uh, was define, define yourself. And uh, there, there are several ways that, uh, that we could build a data for good movement. We could organize hackathons, we could raise awareness at conferences. There were fellowships already before we created this. So it was crucial for us to find our space and define our position in this spectrum. And uh, yesterday, Jake Porway from DataKind was talking about the importance of focus early on when he was talking about how he created uh, DataKind. And honestly, I couldn't agree more. Uh, so we quickly figured out what we wanted to prove, right? So we wanted to prove that it was possible to have small teams of tech people and the main experts working on real world problems from social good organizations. That could be solved in around six months using the power of data with simple and tangible deliverables. Okay, this was the, the, the value proposition. And uh, this premise sounded extremely interesting, but also extremely challenging at the same time, especially considering that we wanted to achieve all this as a pro bono volunteering initiative. And then we figured, okay, so we want to act as facilitators in putting all these people together. That's all good. But these are real people and these are real problems. So now we have the responsibility of guaranteeing quality, quality of the projects, quality of the deliverables and managing expectations, both for our volunteers and our beneficiaries. So how, how do you do that? And that brings me to lesson two, set up the processes. So in order to answer the question of how do I try to help society with data projects without creating even bigger problems while I'm at it, we set in motion an initiative to clearly define all the steps of starting a social good project. And it looks something like this. Uh, we knew we had to meet our beneficiaries, get closer to them and really feel what it is to live their reality. We also knew we had to clearly define problems to address because beneficiaries have a bunch of problems and we can't attack them all at the same time. So we had to prioritize them and write down descriptions and requirements. 
Not just that, but we also knew we had to understand the level of data literacy. And we, we had an interesting talk about data literacy yesterday uh, in this summit. And, and it's true, data literacy in, in each organization is very different. And we had to see realistically what we could achieve from a tech perspective. And so we defined the project scoping step. And this is an iterative step, how you can see, uh, just how, it's how, how you can see in this diagram. Uh, after that, we had to guarantee that all ethical standards were being respected on the project that we drafted with the beneficiary. And so we surrounded ourselves with specialists and created an ethics committee to oversee our own work at Data Science uh, for Social Good Portugal. After that, we also knew that we had to create a fair, open and transparent process when creating the project teams, assembling the volunteers, while at the same time, guaranteeing that the teams had all the necessary skills to do the job and deliver. So we created our recruitment process. And in the spirit of being a facilitator, we also wanted to reach a balance between giving the team autonomy while simultaneously managing the project and guaranteeing roadmap and deliverables. So we defined roles and project management processes. We also wanted to give teams access to tools for their work. So we made partnerships with tech companies to get software. And uh, this is what we did to guarantee that the projects get done. Uh, and lastly, we wanted to involve the beneficiary frequently during the project life cycle so that we could quickly iterate on the solution and especially measure the impact of the deliverable after the project was completed. So all of this was written down in, into what we call now our handbook. And we now follow this instinctively. So, okay, cool. We have the players, we have the board, we have the rules. So the question is, when do we start to actually play this? And this uh, takes me to lesson three, create portfolio. It would be extremely naive to think that we figured out all this in a flash. Truth be told, uh, we, we really didn't. Uh, the way we managed to reach this point was by testing, failing and iterating while working on our projects. And that's why it's so important to create portfolio soon. So let me share with you all a bit of what we're building with the help of our volunteers and beneficiaries. Our first project was with uh, Rotaract. Rotaract is a global organization that empowers students and young professionals to create positive change around the world. And what we did with them was extremely simple, but extremely useful for them. We did an exploratory analysis of their data regarding their national fundraising against cancer in the county of Santo Tirso in Portugal. The goal was to provide an interactive report to support future decisions and op optimize processes about their fundraising campaigns. After that, we did another project with the Associação Zoófila Portuguesa. This is an organization that promotes animal rights and they actually have a small veterinary hospital. So we wanted to see if we could reduce the waiting times for clients on scheduling appointments and treatments at, at the hospital for their pets. We did descriptive analytic, analytics and clustering methods to group patients and better understand their correlation with the time spent in the clinic. Uh, we're actually gonna install, uh, I just got this update today. Uh, we're actually gonna install this at the beneficiary in the next two days. And uh, we envision that in the next two weeks, this, was already, this will already be finished and implemented there for their use. Another project that we have ongoing is with Kaish. Kaish is an organization that helps people in vulnerable socioeconomic situations. And what we wanted to do with them was to evaluate and uh, be able to communicate the social impact of their magazine. They have a magazine that they give to their, uh, their, their uh, beneficiaries and they become sellers of the magazine in order to come out of their poverty situations. So we wanted to see and analyze the income distribution of the sellers over the years and be able to do a campaign of storytelling so that we could raise awareness in society about uh, uh, future campaigns from, uh, from Kaish. And uh, lastly, the project that we're gonna start very soon is with Fruta Feia. This is an association focused on fighting food waste. And what we're gonna do with them is optimize the process of food basket delivery and uh, use data to automatically suggest food basket content taking into account, for example, the maximum weight and other delivery constraints. Uh, we're finishing this, the, the, the scoping step of this project, so it will come out very soon. So there you go. This is our current portfolio at the DSSG Portugal. Next up, I want to talk to you about lesson four, adapt fast. 
uh, let's talk a little bit about adaptation, which in my opinion should be the word of the year for 2020, honestly. I don't know if you guys agree. Uh, like DSSG Portugal was also extremely affected by COVID-19 as all of us. Uh, one of our projects got severely delayed. Another project got completely postponed and uh, our beneficiaries were themselves closing operations or refocusing their efforts. So we found ourselves between a rock and a hard place. Our dreams of growth for the year 2020 were just going down the drain. Yet we looked around us, we took a step back and we just adapted. We looked at COVID-19 and saw an opportunity to do something we hadn't yet tried because it was out of our focus at the moment, working with government data. I won't go into too much detail here, although this is a fascinating story and the true pivotal moment for us at TSSG, because you will actually have the chance to hear it in detail in a talk on week three, on October 20th, to be more specific. But it was truly incredible. So stay tuned for that talk. And uh, and uh, yeah, it was, it was really cool. Um, and it was also a way to solve another problem we had, which was related to managing volunteers, which was, how do you engage a community of hundreds of people that want to help when you can only have a handful of projects each year where each project has a team of five people? Extremely tricky, tricky, extremely sensible. But since we were forced to adapt to not lose an entire year, we actually created a new initiative that we call mini projects that stemmed from our COVID-19 project. More about that on the next talk. And that initiative ended up right now being the answer that we needed for our problem. So there you go, adapt fast. And now lesson five, make it sustainable. Uh, the formula that I showed you guys before is actually incomplete without its third stakeholder, companies. Our financial stability vision had companies at the center of the equation, but we had yet to figure out a clever and effective way of including companies by bringing them value and creating win-win situations. Companies have interest and resources to participate in social good initiatives, they do have. They are just lacking the opportunity to do it in a streamlined way. That's what we found out. And that's where DSSG can also help. Uh, we identified four main ways companies can co collaborate with us and our social good projects. Although we're still testing this approach, I'd like to highlight our idea of, of project patronage, where we envision companies having the opportunity to choose projects with which they identify and back that project financially and directly guaranteeing also the long-term financial stability of our organization and even its growth. So there's also other ways to collaborate uh, by either sharing tech that helps our projects, sharing know-how, or even sharing data that complements the data from the beneficiary. Last but not least, we have lesson six, which is, it, it's one of my favorites. It's walk the walk. I mean, we all like to say that our organizations are data driven, but very few actually are. And we, we know when we're inside. Uh, when we look at the realm of nonprofits, this picture gets even worse. So since one of our values is precisely that, being data driven, we decided to put our money where our mouth was and implement several processes to make our decision making truly based on data. We created three main initiatives, internal OKRs and KPIs to measure our own success and growth. By the way, we're at 40% for the second semester of 2020, so good news. Uh, second, evaluating how the project was managed by measuring the duration of the different phases I just talked to you about, response time of each stakeholder, and compare them to our benchmarks so that we guarantee also happiness inside the project team. And lastly, measuring the impact of the project, and this is extremely important, measuring the impact of the project and the deliverables on the beneficiary six months after implementation. Out of curiosity, I, I just like to share with you the feedback we got from our first beneficiary in our first project, Hotara. Although our impact measurement has mostly quantitative metrics, I want to focus here on the comments because I think that they better detail how useful the deliverable was to the organization. So I'll just read them out loud for you. Uh, so one thing they said was the findings were useful to prove that our elderly population who has a tendency to give up on our initiatives as they grow older, their participation was actually paramount. And the visualizations enabled us to better communicate the results of the fundraising campaign to the mayor of each county, appealing to their sense of responsibility. This was extremely positive feedback, a real impact on real people done in a simple and fast way. And that's the note that I want to leave you guys with today. I believe that true long-lasting social impact will not 
be created with just volunteer part-time work, as it shouldn't. But still, it's amazing to see how incredibly simple solutions developed in just a few months can have such an impact on an organization when you have a framework that facilitates that work. This is our social media. If you want to follow our work, I'll be around in the networking to answer your questions. Thank you all for listening to me.